So yeah, I'd like to present uh, the current status of the challenge on, on, on behalf of, of a large group of people that work really hard to make it possible, uh, which is um, Mai Yang in our lab, Chi and, and David, who just presented, Francesca Australia, Wiping Ma and Pei Bang in Monsanai, Tom Yu and Andrew Lam Sage, Sam Payne PNNL, Paul Boutros, our chair, and Gustavo and, and Henry. And as Gustavo mentioned before, we just closed the challenge a few hours ago, so we don't have really just the full flesh analysis and insights from the challenge, but we'll give you a, a bit of a, a, a teaser and a bit of a sense of where we are, and we really hope to be able to also discuss uh, uh, with you about uh, this challenge. So as we heard already in both previous talks uh, from Henry and later from David, uh, so really the, the question that underpins this challenge is, is this basic question of how the information in the DNA is transforming RNA and proteins and eventually in function. And, and more specifically, uh, to what degree, let's say the levels of proteins uh, are determined or can be predicted from, from the levels of RNA and genomics and, uh, and there is abundant uh, uh, literature and studies around these questions and this recent review here from uh, uh, Jansen Liu, Andreas Bayer, who actually I think is around, and, and Rudy Abersold. So there are different numbers from different groups about how much really from the protein you can predict from, from expression, and of course even more about how much of that you can uh, be able to, to predict, uh, or how much of the function of, of the proteins typically uh, we use as proxies. Post-relational modifications such as phosphorylation, how much of that really is, is determinable from, from the upstream um, component. So that's the the, the general uh, framework this challenge uh, uh, falls and, and, and more specifically, and again, I'm going very briefly because we heard a uh, nice motivation and a nice example from Henry and David before. This is particularly relevant in the context of cancer, which even though it's driven by genomic alterations, these alterations manifest themselves at the levels of proteins or, or post-relational modifications that we are able to, to measure with increased facility thanks to mass spec and other technologies, but we think this needs the development of, further development of computational tools to make the most out of this data. So, we were really lucky to be able to partner with uh, CPTAC, with Henry and, and the rest of, of the team, because it allows us to leverage for these questions really unique data sets. First, this is the published study, uh, the hallmark studies on, on both on breast cancer, uh, led by the Broad, and on ovarian cancer, led by PNNL and John Hopkins, that provide us really rich data sets that we could uh, use to, to answer this question since we had genomic data, copy number, expression data, mRNA, proteomic data, and phosphoproteomic data. And, and the numbers are, are, are quite good, are, are the largest studies of the art, and this was published recently just before we launched the channel challenge, so we could provide this to participants to train the models. But even more importantly, CPTA kindly agreed to share with us this unpublished data that uh, also Henry described, this prospective data, again, both in breast and ovarian cancer. In this case, was uh, the proteomic and phosphoproteomic was done with a different technology, TMT, which is more advanced, but it was the same type of data, and, and because we were able to use it for the challenge, for evaluation and for test purposes, it really provides us the right setup to be able to run a challenge, right, where there is data in the public domain that everyone can use to build the models, but then we were able to use this unpublished data to uh, score the, the, the submissions of the different teams. So using this data, we decided to boil down this general question of how the proteome is, is, is controlled or, or correlated with a genome and transcriptome and, and how the function is related to that in three specific sub-challenges. The first one deals with uh, you know, a technical but very important question when using proteomic data, which is that the outcome of these technologies is typically spar matrices, right, compared to transcriptomics, where you typically get, for all experiments, information for all the genes. In mass spec, you have spar matrices, so, so you don't necessarily get all the proteins for, and, and if you repeat the experiment, you may not get the same. So it's an important question in, in proteomics data, and therefore the first challenge is about how to impute the missing protein levels from the levels of other proteins. The second question is this basic question of how well can we predict protein levels 
from transcriptomic and genomic information. And the last question is how well can we predict phosphoproteomics from proteomics, genomics, and transcriptomics? And again, phosphoproteomics is very relevant because it's a good proxy of the function of proteins and therefore about basically the, the cellular phenotype eventually. So this challenge then was done both in the ovarian and the breast cancer data set that I mentioned before. And I guess the kind of the, the long-term things we want to think is, is and, and, and a bit, uh, uh, this is what uh, um, was also mentioned before, is to what degree, if these models are really good, right, if we are able to, to impute proteomic data, maybe these methods can help us to not have to do very deep and very uh, costly characterization of, of the proteome if we are able to impute. And if you are really able to predict the proteome and the phosphoproteome, perhaps these estimated values can, to some degree, replace uh, uh, making the proteomic and phosphoproteomic experiments by just simply uh, using the estimated values for, for replacing it. Of course, it will never be the same, but we wanted to understand maybe to what degree this, this can be done. So as I mentioned before, CPTAC allows us to use unpublished data to to do the test of the challenge. And this was really a unique opportunity, but of course uh, needed a special setup to be able to, to run the challenge. Uh, because we, uh, uh, we were also under the limitation that the, the output data of such challenge to the proteomic data is the input data of such challenge three, which is the, uh, the prediction of the fossil proteome. So to, to be able to use the data in the best way, what we use is not just the way we used to do the challenges in the past where people get the data and then they predict the, product, the, test, the predictions that then we score, but we use this system uh, based on, on, on Docker to, to, to make submissions of the models that will be then internally within the, the, the sign-up system of Sage be evaluated, right? And, and this was done in other challenges uh, recently, such as digital mammography that you'll hear more about later on, and we really leverage the expertise Gain through that challenge in the context of, of this challenge so as to be able to use this data set that had uh, a number of, of limitations. This, of course, make the running of the challenge more complicated for participants. Uh, and we're really, really aware of this and of this extra burden that this implies. Uh, and we really strive to make this the more user-friendly possible way. But in, in this context, we think it was, uh, was necessary and, and it really allowed us to, to, to run the challenge. So how did the challenge go? So we started end of June when we opened the challenge. Then we had an open phase followed by two rounds where participants could uh, submit to the leaderboard. And then in, in the very final round that closed last night, uh, we, we just had the final submissions. So as I said at the beginning, we still don't have results, but we at least can discuss a bit based on the results of the leaderboard phase. And, and just to emphasize that it was really quite tricky to match the timing uh, so that we could use this data, which was available to us really a couple of months ago, as soon as it was fresh from, from the production, but also that's going to be put in the public domain in a few weeks. So we really had to find, play really hard with these timelines to be able to make the challenge possible. And also we really wanted to close last night so that we can today, we can discuss openly with different teams uh, uh, their approaches uh, without uh, having some sort of contamination or cross-fertilization between the different uh, teams that, of course, we, we really encourage this, but in, in a second phase, uh, probably in the, in the context of a community phase that we will like to discuss today as well. So, how did it go? So, you saw so this figure from Henry. We had a really large number of participants uh, from all over, over the world. This, again, is the statistics uh, from, from the uh, leaderboard, so we, we need to put together from the final submission, but we had an increase from round one to round two. Uh, we had uh, around in round two, depending on challenge, from 20 to 30 teams. We think these are good numbers, and, and this is also, uh, in a way, a, a more uh, specific type of question proteomics that maybe uh, doesn't reach to um, other um, communities, but were good numbers. And then, what did we learn? I will just give you a, a sense of how well people did in, in these rounds, but 
really what we like to, to do now is to discuss this in more detail with the best performers of these rounds and all participants later on in the, in the posters as well. So the three sub challenges in more detail, right? So the first one was how to impute proteomic data. And here we had an important thing to, to solve, which is uh, the, the lack of, of, of or it's dif difficult to get good experimental st standards to assess the methods because if there is missing data and that's what you want to uh, assess, how do you get it in, in the right way, right? So if it's missing, you cannot obviously use it. So the group of Pei Wan and, and her student Wai Pima developed a very advanced method that uh, we think captures as well as possible the nature of, of the data. Of course, this allows us to have a, a proper gold standard for scoring, but at the end of the day, even the best method is simply an approximation of the reality. So it has the limitations, but this allows us to have a number of test data that we could score using the standard metrics such as RMSC and Pearson correlation. And just as a sense of how things go, here you see according to these both metrics, the correlation and the, and, and the RMSC, the performance of participants in the second round of the leaderboard. And here we added three state-of-the-art baseline methods, and you can see that teams are able to go beyond that. And we'll hear both from Bringo, who is here, and, and also from uh, Hong Jiang and Zhuang Fan uh, later today. And again, there is the poster from Wiping number 19 to go into more details. Sub challenge two, which was how to predict proteomic from copy number and, and transcriptomic data. Again, we had the test data from, from the CPTAC, and we focused on proteins with less than 30% of missing value, scoring using the standards, standard metrics such as RMSC and Pearson correlation. Here again out uh, from the leaderboard, you can see the baseline method, uh, standard uh, random forest, and how several teams, including Hyun Jung and Joan Fang, who will present later, did well beyond that. And again, this is not the final submission. For more information, there is the port is from my. And finally, uh, the phosphoproteomic data, right, very similar setup as the previous one, but we played the phospho, not the proteome. We use the similar data and similar scoring metrics. And here, we didn't have uh, so good performance yet, only, only the team of Han Jiang and Jiang Fang, but uh, we know this is a more complicated question and we hope we're able to uh, uh, learn more about this question in, in also probably in a collective round. With that, just to say where we stand, uh, we need to do the scoring, announce best performers, analyze the results to understand what works best to, for solve the challenge. We want to apply these methods in, in other data sets where perhaps there is no proteomic, but there is transcriptomic and other omics and, se and see how this can be used uh, 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 to replace it to some degree. And this is something we like to discuss in more detail. And probably to do a collaborative round, given that we really have to rush the challenge, given the time constraint I mentioned, to try to, to learn a bit more uh, in a collaborative way. And with that, yeah, I'd like to thank again the people in the team that I, I also introduced at the beginning of my talk. Of course, all participants, you made this possible. The data contributions from CPTAC, the founders, CPTAC as well, as well as NVIDIA and, and Google for providing cloudy time and, and our partner journal and action methods. And if you want to know more, we will be doing analysis over the next months and we'd like to discuss this in detail in a meeting coming, uh, coming April in Paris as satellite or we come. So if you're interested, please join us there. Thank you. <laughs>